there's so much potential um, in e-commerce. I believe it's also starting to become really saturated on people doing like the skinny fit tees, the watch companies. Uh, there's like MVMT or movement watches. There's so many of them. But the potential is there. And, and the reason I see the potential is there is people are like, wait, there's all these middlemen who are taking huge fees. Like, why can't we create more affordable versions based on what people want? And they're more in touch with the customers than a lot of these large corporations who are just thinking things of assembly line and the machine and cranking things out versus like, hey, I'm the end user. My friends are as well. And like, you're not creating anything for us. And yet we're buying all this crap stuff. So it's like you start creating their own products. And then on top of that, they understand these modern marketing platforms like social media where these large corporations struggle with it. It, like think of it this way when hello and welcome to the robust marketer today we have my actual first true legend of the space here we have neil patel uh you probably know neil he's a best-selling new york times author uh forbes has named him a top 10 global marketer he co-founded Crazy Egg, Hello Bar, and Kissmetrics. Uh, he came to the game focused on SEO, but he's now probably one of the foremost experts in the world on how to convert traffic into leads and sales. I'm super happy to have him here. I actually, in, I've introed him twice at Affiliate World uh, events, and I'm sure that will happen again because he's always such a big hit when we have him there. Welcome to the Robust Marketer, Neil. How you doing? Good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man. No problem. So. Tell us a little bit. I think probably a lot of people know who you are. Um, tell us just a little bit, your thumbnail sketch of sort of how you got to where you are today, how you got started in the game and, and sort of, yeah, key moments along the way. Yeah. Uh, you know, brief version. I was 16, tried to find a job online, couldn't. So I created a job board uh, and then it popped up the site. I was just like, oh, why isn't anyone coming to the site? I thought if you pop it up, it would just naturally become popular. I quickly learned that you had to do something called marketing. Didn't know how to do marketing, paid a few marketing firms, lost all my money. I was broke, frustrated, so I had no choice but to learn how to do it on my own. I did it, got good at it. Still didn't make any money from the site, but eh, I was at least getting traffic. And then from there, I decided, you know what, I'm going to start doing this for other people. Started cold calling, doing whatever to get customers, eventually grew that. A lot of it came from word of mouth. And then from there, you know, uh, went into the software world and a few other different ventures, but still have a consulting agency, Neil Patel Digital, uh, and still do software like Crazy Egg, stuff like that. And of course, as you know, I speak all around the world. Yeah, that's awesome. I wanted to just ask you, uh, what, what are you most excited about, like professionally right now? Like what's really lighting your fire right now professionally? So I believe that there needs to be a consolidation in the marketing space. There's too many of everything, too many events. Um, like AWA, you know, whether you know I was invited to speak or not, I love the event. I think the quality is really high. But if you look at the event space, I bet you would even agree there's too many events, and in which a lot of them are mediocre, right? Like. Your team, they have this belief that, hey, we need to go above and beyond and create the best experience even if we lose money, right? But I think that's what's made you guys successful. Now, there's a lot of people who just throw events, mediocre speakers, mediocre content or outdated content, and it's just not that useful. Um, there's a lot of marketing tools. Too many to even count, right? Some are free, some are paid, just too many. There's too many marketing blogs with the same regurgitated information. There needs to be consolidation in the space. And more importantly, instead of people just getting information, there needs to be a change in which people are using things like artificial intelligence and machine learning to not only give marketers actionable feedback, but also help them make the changes as well. So I think there could be a lot of automation in the space, and that's what excites me. And I don't see it yet, but I bet we'll start seeing it within six months. Very cool. Have you seen the most recent? Have you seen Avengers, uh, the most recent one? Yes, I have. So Infinity you're basically War. you're advocating a Thanos-like approach to consolidation. You just want to reduce half the the population of, of bad actors out there. Yeah, and, and <laughs> I don't mind more good stuff, but like a lot of the content's just mediocre. Like think of it this way: with AWA, I hate how you guys make me do rehearsals for speaking. I think you figure that out by now. Yeah, yeah. But you guys do everything from like, okay, here's how we're going to do the introduction. Here's how you're going to start. 
etc. But if you think about it, that's also what makes a quality high. Whether I like it or not, that's also what makes a quality amazing. But I, again, think it's because the team cares so much, right? Um, and if you think in general, a lot of the people are blogging because they want leads. They're not blogging because they want to help people, right? You guys started doing affiliate events because your founders are affiliates and they're just like, oh, why can't we meet with like-minded people and help each other? Yeah. It was yeah. done out of the necessity to educate and help versus, hey, I just want to monetize. And if you look at most businesses, they make money because they solve a problem, not because they're trying to make money. And I don't want to take the Thanos approach of just snapping my fingers and boom, half are gone, but close enough in which I'm just hoping the crap just dies down or people buy them up and start gobbling up things. Yeah, and I th you're seeing that happen for sure, I think. I, I came from the DSP space and, and that's a really – Interesting one. I know I, I just saw a recent interview where you were actually talking a little bit about the blockchain, a little bit of, uh, about ad networks because you're involved on the board or as an advisor to, uh, what was it, to Kind Ads. Yeah. Um, but this idea of sort of accountability in, that, in the advertising space, and I think it kind of goes across like, yeah, there's a lot of crappy events, there's good events, there's bad events, there's good ad networks, there's bad ad networks. There's so much bad traffic out there too. There's so much sort of garbage traffic out there, fraudulent traffic that, you know, publishers just playing this game uh, and, and, you know, like everyone along the chain just sort of keeping the game going because it just, because more money is created. But there's just so much waste in the space entirely. I totally agree. And I, I think we're going to start seeing changes. And the big reason you're going to start seeing changes is these venture capitalists were investing fifty, hundred million dollars into these marketing technology companies when their revenue and their profit margins just don't add up to the valuations that these companies were getting, right? And you're seeing rounds of layoffs and people changing and founders leaving. Like you'll see cons consolidation, whether people want it or not, because the money backing a lot of these companies are like, crap, we're going to lose our money, so they have no choice but to start consolidating and get more creative. Nice. So where is your focus these days? Like what, in terms of your businesses, in terms of neilpatel.com, crazy egg, uh, kiss measures, all these things like where, where is, what does your focus look like on a day to day basis? So funny enough, I bought out kiss metrics, the site, okay. not the company. So that'll get merged into neilpatel.com. Uh, my ad agency, Neil Patel digital takes up majority of my time. I also am building, I'm turning Neil Patel into a site, like a tool. It'll be called like Neil Patel, your digital marketing assistant where my goal is to take a lot of the features that you're seeing in applications like SEMrush. Are you familiar with SEMrush? Yep, totally. And we're releasing all their data and everything for free, right? Creating competitor versions. Same with like Majestic, uh, Hrefs, uh, Moz. Consolidating these tools and releasing everything for free because we don't believe information should be charged. Uh, and then what we'll do is we'll start automating marketing tasks and procedures so then that way people aren't just staring at reports a system is telling them what changes to make and ideally which is hard will make the changes for them as well this is really interesting this is i was i just did an interview with um uh with click funnels i did an interview uh yesterday as well um where, we, where people were talking about this idea of uh it's like i don't know it's not web 4.0 necessarily but it's this sort of dynamic experience when you come to a website where instead of just going to like navigating through menus you sort of get led through a bit more of an experience and I feel like you've done a really good job with that with neilpatel.com because you're you know you, you go down it's like hey step one start a website here's some resources on starting a website essentially but is that something you think about about ways because you're obviously your audience has got to be very broad you're going to get newbies looking to make money on the internet you're going to get coca-cola looking for a, a consultant like how, how do you manage different you know your different audience when they come to your website and what, what are your plans around that yeah, it's a, a lot around personalization, and we're trying to figure out how to personalize the user experience based on where they're coming from and who they are. Now, with GDPR, it makes it a bit more tricky, but we are trying to do a lot of that kind of stuff. We're trying to figure out how to do this without breaching people's privacy or being creepy or anything like that, which is very hard. Now, with GDPR, do you advocate taking like will you will do you advocate that marketers take a blanket approach and just sort of get, like get everyone up to the GDPR standards because you kind of have to, or will you serve people dynamic experiences? You know, like depending on where they're coming from. We already serve dynamic experiences uh, based on where they're coming from. Like on NeilPatel.com, you're from Canada, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so you get the same experience as the U.S., but if you're in Germany, for example, you would get a totally different experience and a totally different site. 
That makes sense. Because so, you, cause you think, don't need to be, be as compliant in Canada and the U.S. or, you know, so why, why have that, that waste, basically? Well, more so the way we look at it. It's the same domain, but we create different experiences based on where you're from. But And, and the reason we do that because it boosts conversions. But we will take a blanket approach and make our whole site for every single region GDPR compliant. Um, it'll probably reduce revenue and uh, reduce conversions. Our feeling is, you know, we like GDPR compliance. We think it's a good thing for the web uh, and it protects users. So we're going to take a blanket approach of making every single region compliant with GDPR, even if they didn't have to be. Nice. So with NeilPatel.com, you're probably taking a pretty high level of client generally. Is it, is it, these are Fortune 500 companies? Like what, what, is your, what does your client portfolio look like with NeilPatel.com? Funny enough, it's a lot of SMBs. Uh, more than, we have the Fortune 500, but we make more money from the SMB market. Um, and let me define SMBs because most people think of SMBs as like uh, mom and pop companies. Mom and pop shops, yeah. But in like the United States, I believe SMBs is defined as like 100 million bucks in yearly revenue, right? So Not my mom. Yeah, <laughs> there you yeah. go. But uh, yeah, so a lot of our clients are like that middle ground where like, they're doing 60 million a year, 50 million. Some are smaller, like five, 10. Um, those are more rare, quite a bit rare. Like I was talking to someone yesterday, they'd be on the smaller size, they're doing around 80 million a year. Uh, but our sweet spot is somewhere between like companies doing, I don't know, like 60, 70 million all the way up to like, you know, in the billions. But usually between the, you know, mid to high eight figure range all the way to high nine figure is where most of our clients uh, fit. Very cool. And these are service companies, brick and mortar companies. Are you doing a lot of e-commerce companies as well? Yeah, there are a lot of e-commerce companies, like one of them sells mattresses, right? Nice. But you think about some of these companies, they're not sexy, but we all have mattresses in our home or a lot of us do. It's a huge market, right? Or like we'll get hit up by a company and they'll be like, we sell ceiling fans. Oh, we sell them in retail stores. We want to be online. And you wouldn't think that, oh, this is a big company, but like, oh, we've been around for 50, 60 years, right? And they're just crushing. They do millions and millions a month in profit. Um, another big account that we have is a window company. So you wouldn't think that, hey, what is a window company paying us? It's not sexy, but they're known for ha having their windows in all the major like construction stores. And they're like, oh, we want to get people to know about our windows online. And these are for people who do home renovations, like all different styles of windows from sliding to like uh, those bay windows. But yep. those are a lot of our businesses because if you think about the world, a lot of the money is in these ugly, boring industries. It's not always in the Googles of the world or the Apples of the world. Exactly. And what's happening with companies like these windows is – you know, because of the internet, because everyone is getting more agency and ability to, to make decisions, people are taking home renovations on themselves, they're getting more active in it. So so these people want to get their brands out and, and be searchable to, to, to the average consumer. Yes, exactly. That makes perfect sense. And so then your strategy, you, your strategy is quite good then because you've built, you, you're obviously an SEO master, you, you built up, you, you rank, what do you rank for online marketing? I remember when I first met you, you were talking about you, you rank like number one or number two for online marketing. Yeah, I even rank on page one for SEO. I think, let's see in the U.S. I it's think I. Test. Yeah, I'm like I'm loading it up on my computer in like an incognito window. Uh, I rank. Let's see. There's one spot I rank number in the U.S. I'm number three. Nice. Four? No. Three? I'm number three, and I'm number five. So I have two spots in the top page. Amazing. So you're, yeah, you're ranking for these terms based on your, your long history, but your constant efforts to, to maintain this. And then people just kind of come into your funnel and then, you, you know, then you're also, then you're, you know, they're seeing pictures of you on stage. They know you're a thought leader. Like it's pretty airtight funnel, it seems like. Correct. Well done. Uh, so I, so I had a question here about, uh, you know, you're, you're sort of an expert of the technical infrastructure of, of SEO, but you're also someone who's really good at the, like, the really human side of persuasion, understanding hum like consumer psychology and, and things like that. I'm wondering, which of those sides are you, did you come more naturally to? Um, neither. So I, I would say the SEO side I had to learn and the persuasion side I had to learn as well. And they went hand in hand because when I started my first website, I got no traffic couldn't afford paid ads, so I had to learn SEO. 
and social media wasn't around back then. Then from there, as I said, oh, I suck at monetizing, but I'm good at getting traffic. Let me do this for other people. I had to pick up the phone and cold call everyone who was spending money on Google ads because Facebook ads didn't exist at the time. And I would try to convince them on how majority of the traffic goes to SEO. Let me do your marketing for free. If I perform, pay me. And then eventually I started selling people right away and doing non-performance based. Cause I was like, wait, why not get money up front if I can? So I had to learn persuasion and sales as I was doing SEO. Cause I was like, if I don't do it for anyone, I won't make money. So I had to figure it out. Nice. And that sort of defines, it's funny. I, I was watching one of your other interviews too. And you were saying, uh, you know, the difference between success and failure is just repeated attempts. And you yeah. know, the, the more times that you fail, the more times you realize, Hey, I shouldn't do it that way. I should try another way. And then the more like you are to find the things that work. It, it, exactly. And it says like everyone gets it wrong or most people get it wrong in which they're just like, Oh yeah, you know, this person was so lucky. They're so successful. Then they keep doing another stuff. They're so smart. You know, they just have that natural ability. I'm like, what are you talking about? These people are overnight successes. They've failed so many times. They've learned what not to do. Yeah. I, uh, I, it's not as sexy as the silver bullet system that people maybe want to hear, but it's just, it's the only way I think in my experience as well. Um, so I wanted to ask you, what's, what's your take on the, you know, we're, we're putting a big focus into e-commerce right now. We've got e-commerce mastery live coming up in Barcelona on July 20th. We're, we're bringing in a cross section of people. We've, we've got people who are building general stores. So we've got like the tans who are, you know, building these, these massive general stores, you know, creating customers at a, at a fast pace. Uh, we've got people that are building like little niche general stores where they're finding passion niches and they're, they're finding products. They're doing hybrid models where they're incorporating POD and, you know, print on demand and, uh, and, you know, locally sourced goods as well as AliExpress stuff. They're sort of doing, and then they're building a brand around the customer experience. Then you've got people like Greta Van Real who are building like eight figure behemoth, you know, uh, performance brands like Skinny Me T and the Fifth Watches. So there's obviously e-commerce is a massively broad uh, area. But w what are you? What's your take on the e-commerce space for? Let's so so say it's the person who wants to get into you know digital opportunities. They understand that their life could be transformed by you know mastering internet marketing, affiliate marketing, or e-commerce. What what's your take for those people in the e-commerce space right now? There's so much potential um, in e-commerce. I believe it's also starting to become really saturated on people doing like the skinny fit tees, the watch companies. Uh, there's like MVMT or movement watches. There's so many of them. But the potential is there. And, and the reason I see the potential is there is people are like, wait, there's all these middlemen who are taking huge fees. Like, why can't we create more affordable versions based on what people want? And they're more in touch with the customers than a lot of these large corporations who are just thinking things of assembly line and the machine and cranking things out versus like, Hey, I'm the end user. My friends are as well. And like, you're not creating anything for us. And yet we're buying all this crap stuff. So it's like you start creating their own products. And then on top of that, they understand these modern marketing platforms like social media where these large corporations struggle with it. it like think of it this way. When companies like who sell ceiling fans hit us up, and they're trying to get on the internet, and this is like they've been doing this for 40, 50, 60 years, and the internet's been around for a long time. Like, they're slow moving, right? Yeah. You're gonna get crushed by these young kids who are just like, wait, why can't I just give away watches to all these people who are famous on Instagram and they're cool, so they'll like them and now everyone will buy them. Yeah, and I feel like I think mattresses are maybe the, the best example of this, of a sort of like there was a mattress cartel. They had the, these ridiculous mat, you know, markups on mattresses. Mat, mattresses are marked up 800%. There's this one experience you have to buy a mattress. You've got to go to a warehouse. You've got to have these aggressive salespeople talk to you. And that you know, then Purple and these other companies, uh, Casper, are just like, there's got to be a better way here. Let's let's cut out the middleman. Let's cut out these warehouses. Let's ship direct. Let's make a great customer experience in that case because you're cutting open a small box and a huge mattress pops out. And so you get this whole experience thing. Um, so it's just people innovating in, in key ways in old industries. Uh, and yeah, it's unlimited and it, opportunity. Exactly. Like if you look at Amerisleep, which I think is even a better case study of that industry, they have brick and mortar stores and they're just like, screw it. Things are going online. And they adapted. They adapted fast. And they figured out how to do all of this being bootstrapped, right? So it's like the reason I like a lot of these companies who have been around for a long time who may not be as sexy or well-known, let's say like the Caspers, you can do it without funding and TV ads and still make a ton of money and be profitable. Like you don't 
it, it, it's funny. A lot of people look at these big, large corporations being like, oh, we can't take them on. We don't have the money. We don't know how to raise you know, venture capital. People like Amerisleep are based out of Arizona, which is not a sexy region in the United States, yet they figured out how to do all of it, bootstrap with very little money and without the founders, right? Like being rich. And that's that performance mindset. That's something, you know, click funnels. Russell Brunson talks about it all the time, bootstrapping this, this SaaS company. And I bet all of your companies are pretty profitable pretty quick as well. I bet you follow, followed that bootstrap model pretty closely. I do. I, I, yeah. I believe if there's no profit, there's no business. Yeah, and that, that I think that's such a you know, and that's and that's what performance marketing enables, and that's what puts both affiliates and you know the, this new breed of e-commerce people sort of at the forefront of these opportunities if they're willing to. Again, think this is something we've talked about a lot um, at Affiliate World, um, you, but you, you know you got to think long term. You got to, and I think that's an increasing thing. You can, I think you can get into the e-commerce game game by like drop shipping from AliExpress, and you can learn a lot from doing that. But long term, it's probably not going to be. Uh, the most sustainable model. You really have to think about customer experience. You really have to think about building a lasting brand that people will come back to. I, I would imagine you'd agree. I agree with that. And if you don't do that, you're going to get crushed by someone else. Yeah, I would I would think so. So my question is, where do you think e-commerce entrepreneurs right now are leaving the most money on the table? E-commerce entrepreneurs are probably leaving the most money on the table by not trying to create a brand. Because if you're going to go buy shoes, if, if I – okay, I'm, I'm going to say a category. You tell me a brand. Shoes. Nike. Cars. Toyota. SUV. Okay, SUV. Oh, a, a kind of SUV? Escalade. Okay. Um, credit card. Visa. Visa. All right. So if, if you think about these brands, you named only big brands, right? Um, they're smaller credit card companies in different parts of the world, even in Canada and the U.S., yeah. There's other shoe brands that are not as well known. And the reason you're picking the bigger brands is because you're seeing them everywhere. Now, I'm not saying you can't create a big e-commerce company if you don't create a brand, but you're not going to create something that's getting easy, makes, is sustainable in the eight figures and nine figures. And here's the thing. The reason these e-commerce companies are growing so fast is because it's not as, yes, ad costs are still going up, but it's not as competitive as most people think. Google AdWords is truly competitive because Google AdWords has been around for ages. Facebook ads is not there yet. Give it another three, four years, maybe two years, Facebook ads will be there as well. Now, we're at the point where if you don't create a brand, when ads become extremely expensive, you're going to start seeing the revenue start going down on these e-commerce brands unless they try to be the next Nike or Visa or MasterCard. You don't have to be a huge brand, right? You can be Lululemon, a smaller niche and uh, grow over time, right? There's so many small brands that have grown uh, really well. I watched a documentary on, um, there was this guy, he passed away. It was a sad story, but it was an amazing movie. Uh, he created, uh, I think it was Ed Hardy or something like that. Okay, okay. And then he created uh, the Dutch the hat brand. And the guy, I think, believe died Long from Dutch. cancer. Yeah. And I, I thought it was an amazing story, and he figured out how to create these brands. And with the Ed Hardy thing, I think it was a lot of it was like tattoo based, right? Mm -hmm. I could be wrong. Uh, and he found the guy, you know, the Ed Hardy guy, and then he figured out how to license it and make it popular and stuff like that. But the guy was really brilliant. And he figured out, he's like, you got to build a brand. If you don't build a brand, you're not going to last long. And that's a really good example too, because it's not like he was building. He, he didn't build out a like a mattress technology or a ceiling fan technology. He literally licensed a passion niche's art. He found a, a, you know some art that that he knew people were passionate about, and he slapped it on some t-shirts and uh, some lighters and you know things like that. Like it wasn't a very complex engineering feat by any stretch. He just decided to build a brand based on on other people's art, which is a, a huge opportunity in the print on demand space right now. Exactly, and he did extremely well. And he didn't come; uh, he wasn't raised with money. He was in prison for a while. Like he figured out how to do it scrappy with very little money. He moved very to America, interesting, with like very, very little money and not much in a bank account or anything. Just like I'll figure it out. But the theme that I'm seeing is it still you still want to have that entrepreneurial spark. You wanna you want to see a problem in the world and fix it. I you know I, I, and that to me is is something that defines. Uh, you know, what's going to really be a successful, sustainable, you know, business that you can be proud of is that you want, yeah, find a problem and fix it. Don't, don't just necessarily, 
uh, yeah, churn products from China necessarily, you know? I, I think yeah, there's but, money to be made doing that and there's a lot you can learn in doing that. But like if you want to get to that next level, I think you've got to think about, about it that way. Yeah, like think of it this way. Elon Musk, a lot of us are trying to create tech and companies where we're selling e-commerce product goods while someone like Elon Musk is like, I'm trying to figure out how to make the people live on Mars, right? Like it's such a crazy problem that he's trying to solve. That's how you build big businesses and wealth. You have to think big. And it's funny, most of us entrepreneurs, including me, don't think big enough. Yeah, I, this is something I, 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 we sort of put these limitations on ourselves in some way. And I think we live, it's funny, I listen to Scott Adams. I, I, Scott Adams is the guy who wrote Dilbert and he's a commentator on politics and stuff like that. And he says that uh, we're headed for an age of miracles. He said that, that what we just saw with North and South Korea, this is one of the first miracles of this age of miracles we're headed for. And we're going to see these new things popping off in the, in the news that just don't really make sense. Uh, but 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 are really positive in a lot of ways, and so I think if you're, you're ever going to pick an era to think big, I think this I think now's the time. I think we're going to see so much change in our lifetime. I I know this sounds crazy, but I think we're in an age where we could potentially live forever. Maybe I'm crazy, and people don't believe that. But like technology is coming so fast that you know we may be able to live to 150, 200, or something crazy like that. I feel, how old are you? You're early 30s? Yeah, I'm 33. You're 33. Yeah, you might, I, I'm 38. So you might, you might just get that, that life extension. I don't know. I think that, I think I'm, I'm in the generation that might not. I'm just, I just heard there was a breakthrough for bald guys. Yes. The other day, there was some, some gene therapy thing. So I'm, I'm excited about that. I'd, I'd get the hair back if I could. There you go. I, I thought about getting the hair back, but I'm like, I like not paying for haircuts. It saves me money. I do like that as well. Um, so here's here's something interesting that I, I when I I was listening to some of your interviews to prepare for this, and someone asked about success, and you said on more than he, the, the interviewer didn't pick up on it, but on more than one occasion you said you don't you wouldn't categorize yourself as a success. Is that was that just a bad interview, or or is that is that how you feel? No, I, I don't feel like I'm successful yet, because I define successful as something different than most people. Uh, from a financial standpoint, I don't think I'm worth that much compared to a lot of my friends, right? Like some of them are worth just a shit ton of money. So I feel poor compared to most of my friends. In addition to that, I, I look at success as how happy you are. And I believe I can be much happier in life. And, and I would say actually happiness is a bad word, more so content, right? Like when you can be content and things are going along and you're just neutral, I think that's very good because happiness is something you may feel and then it can die down and then you can be sad like I don't like the roller coaster I just want to be content in life and just be like very steady and easy going and I feel I'm getting close to there uh it may take me three four more years but I believe I will get there it's an interesting goal for someone who's such an ambitious marketer you know that and I and I resonate with this entirely because I'm you know in a in a whirlwind of 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 things happening here and I'm five ten you know five years out on 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 that feeling but I feel at the same, it, it may, I'll be surprised if you're able to get it because it's like the thing that pro has propelled you so far is that like lack of contentness. It's that, yes. you know, it's that thing that propels you is the thing that wants to make you, oh, well, there's another step. There's another thing. There's a, it, it, and I, I, I'll be really impressed. So what are some efforts you're actually making to achieve that in life? Are you meditating? Are you no, 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 dope? I'll, what, what's going on? My goal is to retire by 40 at the latest, maybe a bit earlier. And what will you do in retirement that keeps you content? I'll work like 30, 40 hours a week. I won't work 70 or 80. <laughs> to me, that's retirement. Nice. Uh, but I'll do things like less speaking. Yeah. Uh, um, I'll do more things like walking parks. I know that sounds crazy, but I enjoy I that as a time. Like for me, after dinner, I don't care to go drink alcohol or go partying. Like just walking around a park or walking around the neighborhood. Like for me, like that's a great way to end the day. Yeah. I, so I'm doing I got a dogs, so I have to walk all the time. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I'm doing a lot more nonprofit stuff. I don't talk much about it. I'd rather not talk much about it. But uh, doing things in the nonprofit world that make me happy and uh, or, or satisfied is just like I, I've thought about it. Like my businesses are so almost on autopilot, and I think they'll be there within a few years. Where I don't, I won't have to work as much, and I should still be able to get similar the same type of growth, if not better growth, because I have amazing people on the team who are smarter than me in areas like sales and operations. And then for my end, I can just go and relax more, which is my goal. 
Nice. Well, I, I really hope you get there. I ha Now, I have to bring this up. I don't know if this is going to make the final interview, but I have this weird thing, and I think you might have it too, where you don't like to wear collared shirts. I don't wear them that often. I think you've noticed that. Yeah, I don't wear collared shirts either because I'm like, what is the po – even polos. Polos are uh, – I haven't quite got to the, like, the, col the colorless polo thing yet, but I feel like – if you watch any movie that's set in the future, like they've gotten rid of that extra piece of fabric because you don't I don't wear a tie. I don't I don't need collars. Give me your, your take on collars. I, I actually have a lot of collared shirts. If I showed you my closet, you would be like shit, because probably more than half the clothes are collared. Uh, but I'm more like uniform style. Like I have mm. a ton of these white t shirts. And I'll go to the store, like I get my t shirts from either Dolce Gabbana or like Ralph Lauren, and I just go buy a shit ton of them. And I'll just like wear them all the time and that's it. Uh, but it's funny, like I'll wear this t-shirt with slacks. Like I just don't care like if it goes together or not. I just do whatever's comfortable. And I prefer slacks. I wear jeans a lot, but I prefer slacks over jeans because they're more comfortable. Slacks. I love it. Everything's got to have stretch. You got to have a little stretch in everything these days, I feel like. Yeah. The best is there's this company called Loro Piana. Uh, I believe it's out of Italy, but there's stores all over like the U.S. and Canada. And they can make like custom-made pants for you as a guy. Kind of a rip-off, right? You have to pay an arm and a leg for them. But they make dress slacks with stretchy fabric. Oh. So like they look like perfect dress pants, but they're just so comfortable. You, I haven't seen any other fabric that's more comfortable than and it's soft, but you're going to get ripped off and probably spend like 1000 to $2,000 per pant. I, I, I love Chubbies. Chubbies is one of those e-commerce brands I see everywhere now, which are, are these shorts with four-way stretch and crazy patterns and stuff like that. But to me, they're a really good example. They're called Chubbies. I'm going to have to check it out. Yeah, check out Chubbies. They're, they're, they're all over social media. I think that they're, they're, one of the, they're solving a problem. Like you don't, you know, yeah, I think bringing stretch to more things, even bringing, I want to I wanna start a collarless shirt company that, that involves stretch. So I'll, I'll hit you up after that. Uh, to, there to, you go. We, I'm we can all discuss for it. that. Because nice. it's like, why can't it be comfortable, have good structure and form, still yet be stretchy and like flexible, right? It's possible now with technology. All right, we're going to make it happen. Uh, the, my last question I just had, uh, it was crowdsourced from, from the office here. You mentioned a little bit, you, you're, you're a minimalist in some ways, uh, but also, and I can tell from your, your couch and your, your background there, you're, you, you like the clean lines and things like that. But at the same time, it's Gold, Dolce Cabana, Ralph Lauren, it's high quality minimalism. What are some things that you indulge on uh, and that you do sort of like spend your money on that you that you get some pleasure out of? Yeah, uh, with clothes and stuff like that, honestly, I, I wear a lot of clothes like T-shirts with holes and stuff, even if they're Dolce and Gabbana and stuff like that. Like, uh, But the reason being is I just do it because I know people who work there and like might as well give my friends business over random people. Uh, and then I don't ever have to go into this store. So these high-end stores just – they don't just send you or ship you. Like they'll bring a person over with a rack of clothes, even if it's the same one ten times. Pick it, tailor it to your body, and then boom, you're good to go. But the reason I have that is because I speak so often at conferences, and some of them require dress codes. So it's like you have to be presentable. Like if I'm charging an arm and a leg to speak, you can't do that and have like a shit wardrobe. You can in theory, but some places don't like that because a lot of the speaking gigs I do are corporate speaking gigs versus okay. just conferences. So it's like internal conferences for like Thomson Reuters or Facebook and stuff like that. Um, and then the – so when you look at indulging, the biggest thing I indulge on is convenience. So clothing, yes, it's nice stuff, but they're coming to my house with the tailor and they're doing it all and they deliver it and I don't have to deal with jack shit. With homes, I live in modern homes because like they're all automated, right? Like on my phone, you know, I can control my pool, the temperature on the first floor, the second floor. I can change the lights on the pool. I can do everything from audio TVs in each room, lights, whatever it may be. I can even turn on and off the alarm, uh, open the front gate, you know, like I can literally do everything. So I look for convenience uh, and the same with – just anything that I do, it's just like I optimize for convenience because I spend so much time working to deal with shit that's not convenient. Now, this doesn't mean I don't do basic stuff. Like, it's funny, you know, um, I have uh, someone who lives here and watches the house because I'm never home. But, like, I do my own dishes. 
Like I like washing my own dishes, not because I'm like, oh, I need to be more humble or, oh, it's not because I won't wash my dishes because, you know, I'm too arrogant. I think my time is worth more. You know, forget all those concepts on why someone should wash the dishes or they shouldn't. I just enjoy doing normal household chores. And for me, it's kind of fun. I know that sounds crazy. So I enjoy washing dishes or vacuuming. It's like, I'm not saying it's a good use of my time or a bad use. It's just for me, it's relaxing. Kind of like how some people meditate. I enjoy ironing clothes. Like, I don't know why, just do. Yeah, I know what you mean. There is a real meditative quality to, to a lot of that stuff. I'll put on a podcast sometimes and zone out and, and, and get, get stuff done around the house. I, and dog walks for me are a big one. I got this dog, so I, we go on these epic walks around Victoria. And uh, yeah, get, cool. a, get, a lot of thinking happens during those times. Um, I love it. And you nice. live in an amazing city. Yeah, which you, you've been here, right? Many times. Yeah, well, next time you we come, have the we... Flow, we have the float plane from Seattle to Victoria. Yeah, that's right. Um, well, very cool. Neil, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. People want to get in touch with you. I assume we go, they go to Neil, neilpatel.com. Uh, check you out there. They can catch you. What, do you have, when is your next uh, upcoming speaking gig? Uh, tomorrow I head to Brazil. Wow. Uh, a few speaking gigs. And then, funny enough, I get back on a Friday morning. And then Friday night I head out to Vietnam. So I have like a maybe an eight-hour rest. Oh yeah, this is the success conference out there that uh, that Nick Peroni is involved with as well. That'll be exciting. Yeah, so I'm just exhausted. I'm like, I wish, even though all these conferences are good, I wish I didn't uh, say yes to a lot of them. As they as they get closer, there's a certain anxiety that crops up about the way that they'll disrupt your life, and I know what you mean about that. I'm about to head to Atlanta for uh, for a big adventure. And it's like, oh, I'm gonna miss my daughter. And it like, uh, once I get there, it'll be fine. But it's those the the, the run up where it's like, okay, there's all these things I got to think about, and that sort of builds up anxiety, which isn't always the best. Yep. Nice. Well, I hope you uh, get everything settled today, and uh, and and I hope you find your contentment within three to five years. Uh, we'll have to do an update then and see if if you're just like blissed out on a cloud at that point, or whether you're still grinding away, working less at forty hours a week. There you go. Nice. All right, man. Talk to you later. Take care.